In one chapter, King David is faithful to his Lord, and in the next chapter, not. And the suspense always is, what will he do next? The whole axis of the story is what takes place in the inner sanctum of the human will by the individual. Because if that's where the axis of history is, so far as God is concerned. Anyway, so uh, Habermas thinks that atheists need to attend to that. Moreover, he thinks that atheists have, well, the Enlightenment called itself the Enlightenment, which is the term of the most outstanding bigotry in human history. I mean, first of all, I want to say, the Enlightenment was an enormously important movement. We all benefit enormously from it. We wouldn't here with, be here with these microphones and these lights and all the medical care that we get. take a bunch of pills at night to keep my heart in order. I'd be long gone without them. And we're all in that position sooner or later. So the Enlightenment is resulted in all that. If you judge it by its fruit, it had many good fruits. But on the other hand, it did choose for itself a name which said, we have the light, you guys are in darkness. I mean, really? How do you carry on a conversation like that? You're written off before the conversation even begins. Well, uh, uh, Habermas points out that there's been a literature of contempt for believers ever since. The future of an illusion. Uh, Freud's book. And uh, Dawkins' book about the illusion. Hitchens' book about religion as a poison. Again, that's not a conversation starter for the believers. You, know, you don't really feel like sitting down for, for lunch and talking about this. Um, and finally, our... Uh, are secular men and women ready to admit that toleration is always a two-way street? It's true that religious people need to learn how to be tolerant of one another and tolerant of atheists and unbelievers. But it's also true that atheists and unbelievers need to be tolerant, especially in the public sphere, the public square, of religious people talking religious language. If that's their native language, they need to be allowed to do that. That's what a conversation means. And you have to learn how to put yourself in their shoes, just as they have to learn how to put themselves in your shoes. And another philosopher from France has written recently that it, the history of the last 70 or 80 years suggests that it's easier for believers to put themselves in the shoes of unbelievers. First of all, you can't get a college degree unless you do. <laughs> uh, then the reverse. Uh, unbelievers seem to be horrified at you. Uh, Sarah Palin, for instance. But uh, just don't understand it. Blows their wires. But believers almost necessarily have to learn to put themselves in the shoes of unbelievers. Anyway, whatever it's worth, that's, why, that's what Habermas means by the end of the secular age, he calls it. Um, we're going to enter a new period in which both, both believers and unbelievers are going to have to take one another much more seriously than they did before in a much more open way. Now, in addition to that, uh, Habermas opens the door to discovering some new incapacities in secularism. Um, Irving Crystal picked this theme up about 15 years ago. He wrote that there are in secularist worldviews certain inbuilt significant incapacities. Two he mentions. First, the philosophical rationalism of secular humanism can at best provide us with the necessary assumptions of a moral code, but it cannot deliver any such code itself. It becomes afraid of judging others. And it can't give a code by which all can live. And so non-judgmentalism, he concludes, I'm not exactly quoting, but paraphrasing him, is not a moral code, it's an abdication. I tell my, teach my children, I know about you guys here, I teach my children, you've got to make at least 12 judgments before noon. I mean, judging is the most significant human act. It makes us, it reveals our humanity and our personality best. Uh, what is good and what is not so good? What is true and what is false? Is this man honest and trustworthy or not? You have to make those judgments pretty quick, quite often. And they better be right. And you better learn how to correct them if they're not. That, that's what it means to be human. To grow in your capacities for judgment and choice. Well, anyway. And the second flaw in secular humanism is even more fundamental, according to 
Crystal. If there is one in indisputable fact about the human condition, it is that no community can survive if it is persuaded or even suspects that its members are leading meaningless lives in a meaningless universe. You're not going to find truck drivers to take the hours of driving a truck and mechanics you know, to dirty their hands and people running elevators and people serving in hotels. You're not going to find a whole population long going on with their lives if they think this is all meaningless. It's all a game. It's all a joke. They'll start acting that way. And you'll see more and more crazy things happen all through a society. So, you know, a, a philosophy that says everything is from chance and chaos and meaningless, nihilism, nothingness, is unlivable by the vast majority of people. A privileged few can pose with it and actually produce great literature. But it's a way of life for a society. It's, it's deadly. Now, uh, a second deficiency, uh, or a third deficiency, moral decadence. Ever since the fall of Rome, historians have noted that civilizations often fall by way of moral decadence. Uh, Abraham Lincoln pointed this out in a speech in 1830 in Illinois. Uh, how the, the men who achieved the independence of the United States were just extraordinary. It would be hard to pull together 120 people, or 100 people, as good as they were in the Continental Congress. Uh, brave, willing to lose their lives, willing to lose their fortunes, willing to lose their reputations as honorable men. Because if they lost, they'd be hanged as traitors, and their children would be known forever more as the sons and daughters of traitors. And they had no munitions factory this side of the ocean. They had no army. They had no navy. What business did they have picking a war in Great Britain? But he said they had so many virtues and so rare a constellation that their children had nothing to do but honor them and try to live up to them. And their children found that hard. It's not so often that the children of very successful people can match the success of, of their parents. It's just, it's just not on the cards. And learning how to bear that gracefully is itself an art. It's not often talked about. But uh, Lincoln went on, but their grandchildren, th their children are try hard, so hard to be like them, live up to them, and their grandchildren get tired of hearing about them. <laughs> and uh, by the next generation, they're forgotten. This is what Lincoln calls the silent artillery of time. The human race achieves a certain high level of virtue, and then it's pounded in. And then you need some force that produces an awakening. You can start to climb back up again. But what are the resources in secular humanism to bring about an awakening? So far, they're not apparent. Because if you think everything is multiculturalism and everything is equal, and it's kind of a fundamental moral relativism and non-judgmentalism, how could you even recognize decadence from awakening. And how can you inspire awakening? What is there in secular humanism to combat the downward turn which most of us see in our own society? I mean in simple things like uh, when I was at Harvard in the 1960s, it's true there was an indifferent uh, guard at the doorway glancing at your books as you went out, but there weren't these weapons, uh, things you had to go through. And they didn't stop and finger everything in your briefcase. Uh, and when you have to put one of those at the door of every, at every door in Widener Library, that's a huge expense. You're adding a million dollars or more to the university expenses every year. For nothing creative, but just because morals have declined. You can't trust people there anymore in the way you used to be able to. 